You're listening to Living Out Our Faith in a Fallen World, a series preached from the book of James by Pastor Rick Dressler at Maple City Baptist Church in Chatham, Ontario. For more information about Maple City, please visit us online at maplecitybaptistchurch.com. We thank you for the sacrifice of Christ. And now, Lord, as we've gathered, we pray that as your word is opened, that the truth of the text this morning will penetrate our hearts and our minds, that we will receive it, And not just receive it, but believe and do what it says. We thank you that you've given us an instruction manual. And so, Lord, I pray that your spirit, with your power, would work in our midst. Lord, bring deliverance, bring hope, bring conviction. Spirit of God, move in our midst this morning. And for your people, I pray that we be changed. And Lord, if there are those here this morning who do not know you as their Lord and Savior, if they're religious, but not washed in the blood. I pray that today would be the day that they would meet the one who died for them. And so, Lord, we pray now that you would be pleased with all that's said and done. Speak, Lord. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Four- and five-year-olds, you are dismissed at this time, and while they're finding their place, I'd ask you to join me in James chapter 1, verse 12 this morning. Uh, James is dealing, once again, with reality. He is speaking to believers this morning, and believers, he was speaking back then. He's not actually speaking. I am this morning. But hopefully through his word, he is speaking. Um, Believers who have been scattered. There's trouble. There's trials. There's pain. And, And James is trying to help them navigate through life in a fallen world with all of its trouble, all of its pain, all of its testing, and trials. James is not delusional to the state of this fallen world. It is not all sunshine and lollipops in our world today. And the fact is, this morning, all of us can attest to that truth. And yet we, as God's people, in the midst of our trials this morning, can hold the opinion of joy, of grace, of even a gift knowing that the God of heaven is at work in our life doing something. He is growing us up. And by his grace and by his mercy, he brings us into times of testing. Why? To reveal what is true of us. My brother and sister this morning, I want you to know that this testing for us, for our hearts to be revealed, is a grace. Many of us live and we don't want to know the truth about ourselves. But I submit to you, that life is a wasted life. We must know who we truly are in order that God can speak and transform our very lives. And so, by his grace, he brings the fire, he brings the test in order for us to see and be transformed. And now we find our way to verse number 12 of chapter 1 as we've been speaking about these trials. Look with me, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptations, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Again, blessed is the man who endures. James is almost bent on convincing all of us that this truth of testing, the fact is the word temptation, is the same word from verse number 2, reminding us that he's still talking about the same thing. But he wants us to know that this must be hammered into our conscience and into our character. Blessed is the man. Happy, literally, is the man. Enjoying favorable circumstances is the man or woman who endures testing and trials. Again, this would be strange. This would be bizarre. This would be ridiculous to take that statement by itself. But that's not what he's doing. He's already reminded us that we can be happy and joyful. Why? Because he's growing us. Believer in the West, we need to grow up. Too long we have been children content to play in the sand instead of being men and women of faith who are strong in him, who are courageous, who have seen victory after victory. He is growing us up. We can be happy in that. Not only that, he is generous with us. He gives abundant life, abundant life. 
We can thank God that he is not willing to leave any of us the way he found us. Do you remember when he found you? We must remember. And God in his generosity says, I love you too much to leave you that way. He is growing us. He is generous with us. And not only that, he grapples with us. In the testing, in the trial, this God of heaven wants to be close. He is willing to wrestle with you. I I don't know if you've ever wrestled before, but it's intimate, man. It's one guy against another guy on a mat. We do with our children, my boys, wrestling when they got older. I had one of our sons that uh, at about 13 or 14, every time I walked by the room at the end of the night, he said, you want to go, old man? (laughs) And of course, in my humility, I had to make sure that his pride was taken care of. (laughs) And Andy would get thrashed over and over and over again. And he wouldn't stop. I'm not kidding you. Six or seven times, I'd walk out of the room, and then I'd hear right before I got to my door, is that all you got, old man? (laughs) I got more. I got more. There's an intimacy. My friend, in our trials, God is wrestling with us. He's grabbing. He's holding. And he's speaking. And he's saying, hey, what's your name? What's your name? Who are you? Jacob. No. Not anymore. Because as a prince with God, you have prevailed. This is our God. This is who we serve. This is not some crazy idea. This is the God of heaven who is growing us. He's generous. He grapples with us. He loves to wrestle with his people. And there is an end game. Look what he says. Blessed, happy is the man or woman who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Approved, meaning genuine, worthy. We have Pass the test. Listen to me. In your, rock, your rocky, rough marriage, it's a test. In your purity, in your singleness, it's a test. In your grief, your loss, your anxiety, your pain, your suffering, it is a test. In your integrity in a broken and fallen world where you could make more by fudging the numbers, it's a test. And God says, I'm doing this So that as we move along on this journey, you can know that you are approved. You are genuine. You are the real deal. You are my child. Um, Listen to what MacArthur says. He says, a genuine Christian is not someone who at one point in time made a profession of faith in Christ. But he or she is a person who demonstrates true faith by an ongoing love for God that cannot be damaged, much less destroyed by troubles and afflictions, no matter how severe or long-suffering the cost. The believer endures the unthinkable. Why? Because the truth is, we know we can be happy because the journey goes to our approval that we receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. There's a pattern in our lives. And listen, We're not delusional. We have been this route before. We have been in the test before. And many, many times I have and you have failed miserably. We had opportunities to show grace and we didn't. We had opportunities to show the truth and we didn't. We had opportunities in that trial and test to really love and be self-sacrificing and yet we didn't. We had an opportunity to speak the word of Christ to someone and we didn't. But yet, a righteous man will fall seven times and they get up and we get up and we get up. This is the way it works because we are moving for a crown of life. That crown literally is interpreted, the crown which is eternal life. Hughes calls it the final endowment of life. There is an end game to all of this, and the end game is life. Abundant life, real life. Aren't you tired of death? 
there's life to be won. And so James says, happy, blessed, in favorable circumstances is the man or woman who endures, who falls and gets back up. Now listen, just that you know, it is not in the enduring, the persevering, um, the patience that somehow we win the crown. The fact is, it is in the enduring and the patience that gives evidence that we already have the crown, right? We're not working. We cannot work for this salvation. There is nothing we can do. We are complete, not in our works, not in our religion, not in, in our rituals. We are complete in his faith and finished work in Jesus Christ. And so we, are, we stand complete in him. Now, I want you to notice one more thing before we move on, because this is not the, the main part of the text that will be. But notice what he says in verse 12. He will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him, who love him. And we need to know this because endurance and perseverance is associated with truly loving God. My brother and sister, our love for our Savior, it wanes and waxes cold. And sometimes as quickly as Sunday afternoon. And the fact of the matter is, if we're going to truly endure, we have got to know this God that we serve and truly know him. Not the God of your imagination, not the God who, who pats you on the head on Sunday for coming, but the God of heaven to know him truly for who he is, because it's in the knowing of him that I can truly love him. Listen, when I was dating my wife at eight years old, um, it wasn't eight and, and it was far removed from that. Young people, just hold on. Don't get in de- involved in dating. I know you hate to hear this, but let me tell it to you again. Push it off as far as you can because it's not worth the drama, all the crying, all the broken relationships, right? You become friends first, right? First it should be spiritual, then emotional, then physical. Parents, you can thank me later. That's the way it's supposed to work. But no one told me that at 12, okay? But I, when I met my wife, listen, I, I, I fell in love with her, whatever that meant at the time. And I want to know everything about her. I want to know her favorite color. I want to know her favorite food. I wanted to know the perfume that she was wearing 40 years ago, which was touche. Yes? Right. I can still smell it. And the more I knew, the more I loved. And the more I loved her, the more I wanted to know about her. This is our Savior. My friend, when we truly know this God, the one who loved us and lavished kindness upon us, who gave his son for us, how can we not long to know him? And in knowing, we will love him. If you and I are going to endure, you you just can't have this mental, oh, I know God. You must know him. And again, the testings bring us to that point. Verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt himself, tempt anyone. And you say, okay, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. We were just saying, blessed is a man, count it all joy. God is growing us up. And now James is saying, hey, don't say that you're tempted by God. God cannot tempt any man, neither is he tempted by evil. What is going on here, James? Have you just lost your mind? How could you say that statement? And he says it for a couple reasons. One is this. In the midst of some of our trials that, that, that will take a turn towards sin, we often are like our first parents. And when we fall and fail, the first thing out of our mouth is this. Remember Adam? Adam, what did you do? And Adam says, that woman that you gave me. Yes? But in essence, you know what he was saying? Not that woman. God, it's your fault. This is your fault. If you didn't create this beauty, I would be okay but you put her in my path. And we have a tendency to do that. We fail and fall and say, well, God, this is the way I am. This is my disposition. This is how I lean. This is my bent. This is where I go. You knew that, so it's your fault that I failed. Wrong. Wrong. 
Listen, there's a great difference between our disposition and our propensities and necessity. A great difference. I can have a propensity to something or a disposition. It doesn't create necessity, right? If you, have a, if you have a disposition for murder, it doesn't mean you have to kill somebody. It is not God's fault. You put me here, you place me, and James will have none of it because he says that's not our God. He does not operate like that. A matter of fact, he's so above evil. He's holy, he's righteous, he's just. He's just. This is not his plan at all, at all. And so he answers that argument before it's even asked. And now James is going to do something that's very important here. He's going to make a distinction between the testings in our life that that we're supposed to endure that reveal what's true and the trap that comes our way that will ruin our lives and our souls. And and it it, it happens in in this verse, actually, in verse number 13 and 14. We've talked about testings. That's God bringing a test or a trial in our life to reveal what's true in our heart. But now we're going to talk about a trap. And this is not of God. And this trap is not to reveal. This trap is to ruin. Maybe a good example of this is is something from my own life that that will, I hope, help. Um, When when I was a kid, I loved my maternal grandmother. Uh, She was an alcoholic. Uh, She wasn't quite right. But I spent a lot of time with her which makes me think the reason I am the way I am today. Okay. Um, and she did crazy things, like lots of crazy things. When, when we were out at a restaurant, she would walk past the tables and steal the tips off the tables as she left. I come from good cloth. Good cloth. <laughs> Cut. And I remember being out with, with her and her friend Loretta. I was, I don't know, I was young, young. And we went to a place called Kresge's. It's an American place. It was a five and dime it was a little store that had a restaurant in there. And we all had lunch, and I remember clearly on that day having lunch, and, and I had whatever I had. I had a French fries, of course. And so I'm there with French fries with my gram, and Loretta's across the way. She has French fries as well, and she says to me, she says, Ricky, now, no one calls me Ricky except my sister and probably a couple punk kids after the service, all right? <laughs> but I will deal with that, all right? Um, my wife didn't call me that. Anyways, so, so she said, Ricky... Um, can I have one of your fries? I said, no. <laughs> no. And I just kept on eating. Then a few minutes later, she asked again, if she, can I have one of your fries? And I said, no, they're my fries. You have a plate of fries. And then she left the table probably to steal some tips. And then, <laughs> and then my grandmother leaned over and said, Loretta didn't want your fries. She wanted to know if you were selfish. It was the test and you failed the test. That was a test. Loretta was not trying to ruin my eternal soul, right? That, that was not, she was not trying to harm me or hurt me. That was a test. And we're about to enter into the world of the trap this morning. They are different. In verse 13 there, when he begins to speak, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and neither does he tempt any man. It's the same word, root word, but, it, but it, it takes a little twist because there's something added when it's used in this context. It's not just a test. This word that he will use from here on out in 13 and 14 certainly is a test in some way, but it's trying to cause someone to make a mistake. It's trying to trap them. This is different now. Not just a test. This is a trap. And notice It's associated with evil. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. So this trap is associated with evil. And and, and again, God has no part of this. Um, Evil is always designed to hurt or to harm. And my friend, listen to me. We live in a wicked, evil world. Our culture is wicked and evil. We have destruction, violence, death, lawlessness. We, We have... Um, we, we have a culture of death. From the, the, the womb to the tomb, no life is sacred in this government, in this culture. A matter of fact, you can be hopeless for a spot in your life and be depressed, and this government will encourage our doctors who take an oath not to harm life, to end a life. And it might be cool when you're 20, but it's not when you get older or you have an issue. 
We're in a culture of death. There is evil. That is not our God. There is an enemy of the soul who seeks to kill, harm, and destroy. And so there are tests to be joyfully, per, that we, we are to joyfully persevere in for our Savior, but now there are, there are traps that we must judiciously protect ourselves. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're looking at these traps. Now, before we begin with verse number 14, um, years ago, uh, Sinclair Ferguson gave a little outline of how this works, how these temptations work, and they're brilliant. A matter of fact, the first time I heard it was from Pastor Dan. He had mentioned these things, and while he was talking about this, I took notes. I took notes on these five, these five avenues, this, this pattern of temptation. And so, take notes. Take notes. Because what he says and how he lays this out is going to affect you it already does. It will affect you today or tomorrow or next week. Here are the five things we're going to talk about this morning. And this is, this is how, this is the flow of the passage. Here they go. Number one, attraction. What we're going to talk about today, it doesn't change. It hasn't changed o- over 6,000 years of human history. Number one, attraction. When it comes to this trap, the first thing is attraction. Number two, deception. Deception. Number three, preoccupation. Pre, not occupation. Occupation. Pre what? Preoccupied. But I have to put the ION in there. It doesn't make any sense. Preoccupation. Exactly. That's what I said. Preoccupation. <laughs> Just have to listen better. Attraction, deception, preoccupation. Number four, conception. And number five, subjection. This, this is a pattern. This pattern is repeated every day in our world when it comes to being trapped and harmed. Attraction, deception, preoccupation, conception, subjection. Let's look at the text. Verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away of his own desires and enticed. Notice, each one. Each one. This morning, I don't care who you are. I don't care the level of spiritual maturity you have, how long you've been in church, whether you are saved or lost or have never darkened the door of a church until today. Each one. There is no exception to what we're talking about this morning. There is no one who is above this. There is no one who's conquered this. Each one of us is tempted for this trap. We're attracted. It's attraction. We are attracted, each one of us, each one of us. And look what he says. But each of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, his own desires. If you have a King James Version, it might say his own lust. And that can be confusing because we think it's all bad. But that word desire literally means a strong desire or longing of any kind, good or bad. Right? So... Love, acceptance, peace, comfort, happiness, food, sex, security, sleep. Those are all desires. And they're not necessarily bad desires, but those are our desires. They are natural within us. And so what happens is we have this attraction of a desire that is, has gone negative. Every one of God's good gifts can be taken and can be turned into sin, every one of them. They're designed for flourishing, they're designed for enjoyment, and yet we as humans take that which is in our heart and we twist it. Simple example, food. Is food good, yes or no? Yeah, it's good. Of course it is. We're we're Baptists, we're having a picnic today. It's food, (laughs) right? But think now, with that desire, which is natural, good. Gluttony or anorexia? Well, you don't have to pick one, but that was a good choice, all right? The problem's not the food. The desire has gone amiss. That's the problem. And so when we really think about this, there are certainly external things that attract our attention, but our battle is within our own hearts. Everyone in this room, the battle starts in your own heart and mind. We are attracted to something that can be sinful. And then he says, drawn away. Everyone is drawn away. 
and this was interesting, to, to cause to change of belief so as to correspond more with the belief of the person or factor causing the change. So I have a belief, but something's going on with this attraction now that what I truly believe is right, that I know is right, now I'm starting to change in that because what is in front of me, this looks really good. And what I believed before now, this attraction is messing with this. Years ago, uh, 30 years ago plus, we had a, a group at my, the church I was a youth pastor at in Michigan, uh, Boys Without Dads. We take them camping up in northern Michigan. And, and we were up way north on this pristine, pristine lake, one that you could see the, about 20 feet down, clear as crystal. And on one morning, I went out with one of the guys, 6 o'clock in the morning, and, and, and we just let the boat drift, and it was just drifting. You could see everything in the bottom. A beautiful weed bed was there. So I took out, I had a little uh, red and white daredevil spoon, my favorite. Just toss that thing out. And, you know, people who fish, they buy lures because they like what the lures look like. The fish don't care, but we like what the lures look like, right? And I'm watching that thing move through the water. It was beautiful. And so I'm feeding it by this, this weed bed one time, two times, and, and just enjoying it. Beautiful. The sun was right. Everything was right. Third time through, I'm, I'm pulling it by this weed bed, and out from that bed jumps this pike. And I could see, it was, be- I, it was like, I was watching like National Geographic. This pike just jumped out, bam, and he hit that lure. Why? Because it was attractive before him. It looked good, but little did he know that that attraction had a hook on it. It wasn't what it seemed to be. He was drawn away. By the lure, the bait, the word literally means that, and he was hooked. Attraction. It will happen today in your life. Whatever natural desires you have a bent to turn into sin are there, and they're active. Attraction. Number two, deception. Deception. This happens in our mind. When we think that this thing now that I see, that before I thought was a problem, now my belief system is changing, that now this doesn't seem as bad, this might just be okay for me. This might bring me happiness, comfort, rest, worth, acceptance. This could be beneficial for me in the long run. We are deceiving ourselves because this lure made what was wrong look good. And now I am telling myself the lie that it just might be. My belief is changing. And listen to me. If you, you, you know this. Here's the attraction, and now here comes the deception. And we say things like this. I know, I know, but I deserve this. I'm tired. I'm weary. I've been working hard. I deserve this. Or no one will ever know. It's me, it's a computer, I'm by myself. No one will ever know. Just this one time. Just this one time. And by the way, you know there's some drugs out there that just this one time, you're done. We have a problem with fentanyl in our world today. We are losing a generation of kids because of this drug. One time. Just one time. Time. It's not that bad. I thought it was bad, but you know, it's not so bad. Everyone's doing it. I have to scratch this itch. And this time, I know I've been here before, but this time, it'll be different. Can you not hear the sound of a serpent in all of those excuses? Because he's a liar. He's been a liar from the foundation. He's not out to help you. And so you have an attraction, I have an attraction, and now we start the deception, that we start believing that somehow, some way, this time, this will be different. Number three, preoccupation. Preoccupation. We're listening to the lie. It's on loop now, and now I'm becoming obsessed with it. I hear it over and over and over again. The desire is all that you think about. And listen, I don't, I don't care what the sin is. This is the process for all of it. 
I'm attracted, I, and then I believe a lie, I'm deceived, and now I can't get this out of my mind. I have to have or do or go or be. James knows what he's talking about. And you know what he's talking about. Preoccupied. Number four, conception. Verse 15. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Attraction, deception, now preoccupation. And listen, that preoccupation can last for minutes or months or maybe even years. Conception, the word literally means pregnant. It means something has just been born. You, you've already, you're there already in your mind. Something now with the attraction, the deceit, and preoccupation, now something is conceived. And what is conceived is not life. And just hold off on your self-righteousness for just a second. Many of us will watch Hollywood and sports figures be immoral over and over again. And what we say is, how in the world would they do that? I can't imagine they do that. And here's the difference. They had opportunity, and you didn't. This idea of conception is when desire meets opportunity. Now, I've been thinking, dreaming, planning, and now it's right in front of me, something's conceived. It's not life. What's conceived is sin. And I know, okay, yeah, you Baptists, we're in the 21st century, so archaic, obscurantist, yeah, you, sin. What a joke. Sin is not a joke. Sin has destroyed this world. Not only is sin lawlessness, it's an affront to a good, loving, holy God who designed us to flourish and have abundant life. But it's transgression. It's breaking trust. We were designed to live a life that reflected all that we received from him. Goodness, kindness, love, fellowship, joy, and then to give it to others to be image bearers, to reflect his goodness. We have failed miserably, and we find the state that we exist in now because of it. We are transgressors. We have iniquity, crooked behavior. We don't even follow our own standards, or we do until it's not convenient anymore. And by the nature of sin, it destroys everything. Mark it down. Every relationship that is broken can be traced back to sin. Every one of them, whether in a marriage, a friendship, a church, a, a work environment, it's always broken. And sin never will give you what it promises, never. Never. The attraction's beautiful, but that's not the end result, ever. It's not to be trifled with. And sin has an end. It has an end. Then when desire hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's full grown brings forth death, subjection, subjection. When you follow this path and you go through all the steps, the last step is not freedom. The last step is not joy. The last step is not, oh, I'm so fulfilled now that I went and did what I knew I shouldn't do. No, the last step is subjection. You are now a slave. You have become a slave and you're a slave to a cruel taskmaster that hates you. And we fall for it over and over again. Subjection, you're a slave, and this sin, when it comes to full birth, kills everything. Just, just, just take a second. And think about your own life, your own relationships, your own conversations, that sin in our life has killed joy, peace, happiness, hope, love, dreams, Health, it kills everything. And this process of temptation is the same for all of us, for all of us. And some of you right now are somewhere on that spectrum. Or you will be this week. And what I'm here to tell you this morning is what James is telling us. As God's people this morning, we do not have to capitulate 
to this. We have been given the whole program. It's right in front of us. There are no surprises. This is how it works every single time. I don't have to capitulate. There are steps I can take. I don't have to go through this. I can actually be victorious, conquer, and be obedient. And it's to our benefit. It's life. Now, let me just, let me just give you one more thing, and we're going we're gonna to bring this to a close because there's way too much here. Many of us would cry out like Paul, O wretched man or woman that I am, who can deliver me from the body of this death? Because that's what it is. It stinks. It looks good. It looks attractive. But it is death. Who can deliver me? And then he says, thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at verse 16. Because, and this is going to be basic, basic, okay? In, in a couple weeks, we'll talk about the rest of this. But how do I then survive this? How do I conquer this? How do I live in obedience? Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers, sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Turning. Don't be deceived. The only way to be obedient in these areas is by truth. And here's the truth. Those things that seem to be gifts are not gifts. They're traps. They're destructive. And they will destroy you. That's not our God. He gives good gifts. And his gifts are given. Listen, he is not a killjoy. Some of you young people think, yeah, Christianity, don't do this, don't do that, don't. That's not Christianity. Christianity is God has come that we have life and life more abundantly. His blessings make rich, and he adds no sorrow to them. And so the first idea is this. We've got to know the truth. The truth is God gives good gifts, and the greatest gift he's given was himself through the person of Jesus Christ. On the cross of Calvary, the Son understood our miserable condition, our plight. We're slaves. We, we, are, we were held in bondage in the marketplace of sin. And in his love for you and his love for me, he did not want to leave us. We were justly condemned to death. We had turned our back on life. We deserve everything we had coming. And yet the Son came and stepped in and lived the life we could never live. He died the death we could not, we can't ransom ourselves from our sin. We're full of them. But he came, he lived, he died. His death was sacrificial. It was our propitiation. He appeased the wrath of God. Why? Because he was perfect. He was pure. There was no sin in him. And yet the wrath of God was poured on his head so that he would take my penalty, your penalty, and be poured on him. I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about baptism. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about Jesus Christ died to save you. And when he died, the wrath of God poured on his head, buried three days. And on the third day, he stood up to show that the, the sacrifice was accepted, that there was a way that the penalty of sin was paid. And this morning, we understand God's good gift. The penalty of sin has been paid. I can be reconciled back to this God who loves me today through the work of Jesus Christ. Not by being religious, not by being baptized, not by being a good person, but by faith, repenting, and believing in Christ and Christ alone. But now listen to me. Not only is it the, the penalty of sin has been paid, but through Jesus Christ now for his people, the power of sin has been broken. And I don't care if you feel it or not. The truth is, who Christ has set free is free indeed. I don't have to be the man I used to be. And you don't have to be the person you used to be. Because through the power of Jesus Christ this morning, we can be free from all of that. I no longer have to be addicted. I no longer have to be caught in porn, alcohol, gluttony, self-righteousness, gossip, Bitterness, anger, jealousy. I don't have to go there. And why would I want to? It always ends the same. We have life because who the sun sets free is free indeed.
And so we're going to stop this morning. Next week we have communion, which is part of the truth process here because as we gather together and stop, we, we put everything on pause, we see the love that God has for us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's the truth. It helps us. And in the days ahead, we'll talk about practical things that we do, but it must start with the truth. The truth is God gives good gifts because he is good. And nothing in this world compares to him. I'll, I'll stop with this quote by, by Piper, and it, it is the direction that we're going to be heading in the next few weeks. He says this, I know of no other way to triumph over sin long term than to gain a distaste for it because of the superior satisfaction of God. Do you know, when you have a really great meal, I mean like a great meal, like steak, the perfect steak. If you're, if you're a vegetarian, God bless you, sorry. Um, but, or a great vegetable, whatever, right? Great, great asparagus, I know, they're delicious. But when you have something like that, and you've enjoyed that meal, the garbage around you means nothing. Because you know what's good. You, you've been fulfilled. You've enjoyed. You've gloried in that thing. And we finally understand the God who is, that he is much better than anything we can imagine. The things of this world that are fleeting and destructive will lose their grip on our lives. And so as we leave this week, remember, those steps, they don't change. We're all exposed to them this morning, and we will be. But now we know the process. We don't have to be deceived. There's a good gift, and it comes from our God. And when I know him and love him, it will empower me to stop. And we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, I, I pray that we would take what you have given us in your word. You love us so much to show us the way our minds and our hearts work, how they're drawn away, how they're enticed, how sin is conceived. And we would be fools not to see it, to heed it, and to stop. The wise man foresees the evil. He bypasses or he hides. He doesn't just go forward. Lord, there are many of us who have, are in this pattern right now, and I pray that we would see the goodness of God in our life. It would change us. And maybe there's one here who doesn't even know the freedom of Christ, that they're trapped in whatever pattern that they've been in. I pray that you'd open their eyes to the truth that there is freedom in Christ. May they find that today. And so, Lord, have your way in our life this morning. Bless our time as, as we close in this song of, of an invitation for us just to be right with you, to confess, to recommit, um, to make things right. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about what you've just heard or are interested in the ministry of Maple City, please visit our website at maplecitybaptistchurch.com.